Hello and welcome to episode 10, the final episode in our expert series where we will be taking a closer look at what a new life in Spain looks like from those who have done it for themselves. We'll be looking at what it was like to settle in, how easy or difficult it was to make friends, was there an expat community already there or was it all about blending in with the customs and culture of the locals? Now answering all of these questions and plenty more, I'm sure, I'm thrilled to be joined by a few members of the Chiero team. So welcome back to Cian Bird. And first timers Claire Hayden and Dawn Bennett. Ladies, thank you for being here. Thank you for having us. Yeah, I'm so thank excited to get into it. We have a lot to talk about, but let's just do a quick rundown. If you wouldn't mind, if you just introduce yourselves and let us know your role at Quiero and when it was that you moved to Spain and where you moved to. Dawn, do you want to go first? Yeah, I can go first. So I am visitor support representative at Quiero. Um, I moved over here around about 20 years ago, um, originally buying the house as a holiday home and then loving it and decided to move. And it's in the lovely place on the outskirts of Amuñeca, which is the Costa Tropical in the Granada province. Lovely. And Cian? Yeah, um, I'm the sales director at Hero.com. I, on Saturday, got on 1st of May, I celebrated my 13th year here at Hero, oh. and I've been in Spain for 14 years. Um, I also live in Almuñeca, and I've only lived in Almuñeca in the whole of Spain. So this is where I arrived, and this is where I've stayed. Fab. And Claire, what about you? Um, I'm a veteran. I've been at Kiro for 10 years now, working with uh, agent support, um, a bit of sales, customer service, etc. And I've been in Spain for 20 years with no intentions of originally coming here. But um, I'm based on, it, again, in Almanaca in Granada on the Costa Tropical. Amazing. And seeing you're probably the best person to answer this, but in case our listeners don't know by now, can you give a brief overview of what Quiero does um, and how it helps buyers look for their new home in the sun? Of course, I'd love to. So Quiero helps people find their sunshine. So we are a property portal and we advertise hundreds of thousands of properties in Spain, Portugal, Italy and France. And buyers can come onto our portal, filter through all of our properties, find, favourite, inquire on any property on our website. And what the main thing is, we're connecting buyers with agents and agents with buyers. We help people all around the world buy their dream home in Spain or rent their dream home in Spain. And I just think I'm just looking at you all on the screen right now in your lovely colours, with your lovely smiles, looking so happy. And you've been there for over a decade. Do you think that passion, that love and that authenticity helps? Because I know it's a UK based company, but you have such advocates amongst the team of being huge fans of Spain. Claire, do you think that that makes a difference every day in your job? Yeah, definitely. It has a huge impact on um, basically your working life. The fact that we can work remotely, but and you can look out of your window every day, you have the sun streaming in. Sorry. To <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> but yeah, it has a huge Im impact on your own um, feeling each day. It helps in how you approach your customers as well. Um you know, if that's email or phone, it does really, really help. Yeah, I can totally see that. Now, Dawn, you're slightly unique because you're not in the town. Am I right in saying you're in the countryside? And is there a there's a fruit farm involved in, in your day? So tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, so as well as my full-time job, <laughs> I also run a, a small fruit farm um, where we're growing mangoes, avocados. That's the ones which I actually sell to um, a local cooperative. So not too far from town, only 10 minutes drive. Um, so the fruit farm itself changed it quite a lot over the years. Um, originally, there was another fruit farm called a Nisporo, um, but they are... Uh, take quite a bit of the work so we decided to change the crop um so yeah amazing really i still you know just find it wonderful that i can even at this time of the year i can just walk down the garden now when i say down the garden 
London, I will just say to people, we are, you know, on the hillside, so it's all terraced. Um, and I go and pick avocados um, and, of course, give them to friends as well. Um, so, yeah, it's, um, it's hard work, but also, you know, just amazing. I still love it that I go down to the trees, pick the fruits, um, have the wildlife, so many birds at the moment, um, just all different animals. Okay, snakes, some people don't like them, I don't <laughs> mind them, various lizards. Um, my favourite, though, of all are chameleons, and we get chameleons, which is, is just wonderful. Um, you know, so yeah, I, I'm still in awe. I, I still love the fact that you can just walk outside, you know, pick a, a lemon or a lime off the tree, yeah. and, and it's just wonderful. It's, How amazing. Um, excellent. Um, was it always part of the plan, or did the fruit farm come after settling in Spain, or did you settle there to do the fruit farm specifically? No, to be honest, um, we got the property originally and it was going to be just a holiday home. So when we um, first purchased it, we did have a gardener. So we used to come over, pay him um, to, to do the lot, actually. And we just literally used it as a holiday home. And then the more I came over, the more was, oh, I need to move out there. So I was very lucky. <clears throat> I managed to get voluntary redundancy. And I was like, yeah, that's me. I'm out of the UK. I'm off. So um, I've got a job lined up um, to go into anyway, which was more so in tourism. <clears throat> and we kept our lovely Miguel on for a few years. And then I just decided... I like being out in the open. So, you know, learnt as much as I could off him and also my neighbours. I've got very Spanish neighbours. And, yeah, so took the farming on myself, you know, pruning, all the lot, really. Amazing. It's so nice to see how things evolve as well and just all of these opportunities that come up. Um, Claire, you settled in a town. So what what are the differences there? Hearing Dawn's story, what's it like in, in your town? What's your day-to-day -day like? How does life in Spain look for you? Um, so obviously Dawn's kind of up in the peace and quiet. Um, being, down, being down in the town, it's a, it's a lot busier. Um, it, it's more hustle and bustle, but we're in quite a relatively smallish town. Um, so the nice thing about it is I'm close to everything. Um, all of the amenities in the town, totally close. My son can literally cross the road and he's at his school. Um, the health centre's really close by as well. But the nice thing about it is that it's, it's you can go out into town, you can walk through and you can bump into people. Everybody's very, knows each other. Everybody knows everyone really in the town. Um, and that's, Spanish integrating as well with us so you can you know it, you can walk through town you'll see 10 people that that you know and it's always there's always a good morning as you're walking around or a stop and a chat so people are super friendly um and also you know you can walk the nice thing about where I live I'm kind of on the edge just on the edge of the town but I can walk down to restaurants i can walk down to cafes uh, everything's within a walking distance yeah lovely really handy and the beach if you like the beach so um it, it's there's not the peace and quiet that you have like with dawn story as much but um i find it a really nice convenient way of life where i can just get everything i need very very quickly um we're super busy at work so that helps that you can just pop out pick up what you need and and get back home quite quickly um yes yeah, it's, yeah. it's it's different but it's cool totally and seeing would you agree because am i right in saying you're also you're not so rural you're you're in the town yeah i'm not so rural also on the outskirts of town very near the beach the beach is at the bottom of our road we bought a lovely villa um about nine ten years ago and it's got quite a lot of garden so we're lucky that we have a little mix of we're in the town but it's very quiet very peaceful a tiny neighborhood um we've got the fruit trees we managed to be able to have lots of time in the garden to do the gardening because that's what i really really love doing in my free time and which means we can have a few pets i love animals um 
there's a lot to say about living in Spain. It's, it's a lot of outdoor living. So having a nice garden, having a few different seating areas that you can sit, that you can entertain. You know, and at lunchtime, I might just say, I'm just going to have a little half hour break today, but off I disappear into the garden, make a little salad or something, take a drink with me. And I just feel so refreshed. Um, and would it help if I give a little review of, say, what I did last weekend and what I'm doing this weekend? Please do. Go on, make me jealous. So average week. Weekends. Last weekend, um, on the Saturday, we popped over to near her, which is 15 minutes over the Granada Malaga border. Um, still very Spanish, but with a higher Brit expat community. Um, lots of nice restaurants, loads of shops. Um, so you really got that hustle and bustle. It's very much a um, much more touristy than Almonyeca. Mm. So it's very nice to be able to dip into that because that is the start of the Costa del Sol coast. Um, so then we popped back home. Um, and then on the Sunday, it was Mother's Day here in Spain on Sunday. And the children have got me some beautiful terracotta pots that are so cheap here that it's not at all like Spanish, uh, English garden centre prices. Um and what was lovely, they said, you choose what you want to do today, Mama. So I said, I want a few hours at the beach. So my husband put on the kayak, the paddle board. We all got our bikinis and shorts on. Um, it was the 2nd of May. And off we went down to the beach. And we spent about four hours messing around in the sea. And it was just amazing. When we got home as well, the boys said, oh, could we just um, clean ourselves up in the pool? And I was like, yeah, go for it. So they all jumped in the pool, a bit warmer than the sea. Um, and then this weekend coming, um, we're off on the um, same road past near her, but we're going towards Malaga and then inland. We're going to go and walk the Caminito del Rey, um, which is a very, very famous walk between this very dramatic gorge. I do have a fear of heights, but I'm going to conquer these. Um, and we're going to camp. We're going to camp in a forest nearby. And, you know, as I say, open door living is the way here, and it's yeah. fantastic. It's, I wouldn't want to bring children children up anywhere else. Totally, I can I can totally understand that. I think outdoor living, the vitamin D, just all of it, the lifestyle, and I can fully see how it appeals. Now, what I was going to ask is to take you all back to when you first left. Dawn, I'll come to you first. But what was it like leaving? Because I think that's a big fear that people have when they first get on that plane and they're saying goodbye to the life that they know and it's it's a lot of change. Was there a pull for you? Was it sad? Was it? How did it feel that first time when you were like, okay, I'm, I'm out, I'm saying goodbye to the UK? Um, I think for me personally, it was quite easy in a way because we it wasn't that we purchased the property and then we were moving straight over because we'd used it as a holiday home. We already knew exactly the property and to be honest with you when I actually got on that plane I didn't come into Malaga I actually flew to Barcelona and we had a holiday over Christmas and New Year and just traveling around went skiing um, and it was just amazing and then we came down to our home here so in some ways I think it was very easy. I mean, it's always difficult, of course, to leave family and friends behind. But I'm going to be very honest. I think personally, because they come and stay with you and I, I get friends and family, you know, normally coming very often, um, you spend really good quality time with the people, mm. you know, where normally you'll see a friend perhaps once a week. Well, no, you don't. You know, they're living in your house. You have, you know, you go for a walk after work. You have a nice lunch out somewhere. And I fa I'll be honest, I found it reasonably easy. I, you know, some of the things you have to, I think, sometimes step back and think, OK, this will get done, but mm. it might just take a little bit longer, you know, persevere. <laughs> Um, but it all, you know, everything works out in the end. So, yeah, I think mine was quite an easy one because I started with a holiday somewhere else. Yeah, lovely. <laughs> what about you, Claire or Sian? Did either of you feel a pull when you first left the UK? Um, I'm going back 20 years. So I was in my 20s. So I was totally, uh, I've been to boarding school as a kid as well. So I was really used to being away from home and family. 
So uh, to me, I didn't feel like a really terrible pull away from family. I was like more just excited. Let's go. Let's mm. go do it. Um, the I was very, very lucky at the time because my partner at that time uh, was Spanish. He was from El Muñeca. And so we had a lot of all the plans in place with somewhere to live. I didn't have to, I had that all set up for me. So I literally just packed everything I possibly could into as many bags as I was allowed onto the plane. And off we went and arrived in El Muñeca. We had a place already rented to stay. Um, my partner already had a job set up. Um, I found the hardest thing for me probably at that time and at that age was the fact that um, I didn't speak a word of Spanish at the time. Um, there were there wasn't the expat community here then that there is now. Um, and so I was totally just thrown into Spain, Spanish culture shock, mm-hmm. everything all at once, which was quite a shock for me because uh, as a young sort of in my 20s, I've been at living independently in UK, working, earning my own money, managing everything. I was very independent. And when I came here, that was completely pulled away. So mm-hmm. I was depending on somebody else to work for me, to look after me. Um, I couldn't really communicate. You know, it was all very nod, <laughs> nod, cc. Smiles and waves. <laughs> Hola. <laughs> Adios, you know, it's really basic. So I think for me, just the hardest thing was being so young, losing that independence and just being really thrown into a massive culture shock at the time. Mm. Having said that, I think it did me a favour that it happened that way because it really pushed me to learn Spanish to, you know, I was completely, we didn't have English TV channels we didn't have, you know, I just had no English contact anymore. So it really did push me into it. And I did learn and pick up Spanish quite quickly, I think, because of that. Yeah, totally. And as Dawn said, with the family thing, you know, my mum's over here for, at the moment, obviously it's a bit more complicated, but normally she's here four times a year, tipping up on the doorstep. (laughs) I'm here for two or three weeks. (laughs) Well, this is it. You've given you've given family and friends such an opportunity as well. That's the other the flip side. Like you say, people coming to visit. See, and I wanted to ask about the expat community, which Claire has just has just brought up. You guys are obviously in this brilliant position where you work together and your friends. So you have friends, colleagues, but that didn't happen immediately. So no. when you first arrived, how was the friend making process? How did you meet people? What were your kind of go to social moments so, um this was probably looking back one of the most difficult parts that and driving um <laughs> so the making friends after we'd been here about three or four weeks maybe even a couple of months i started realizing that i was really missing the closeness of friends of my friend circle back in the uk and um that was it then i was on a mission that we were going to make friends and differently to Claire and Dawn I'd come out with my husband and my parents so my parents had been holidaying in Almanyaka for some time my grandparents had died and then they just said after about seven years of holidaying here you know we want to live there but we'd only move there if you moved there with us (laughs) I was like oh let's give it a go let's try it um we were in our 20s we felt quite you know, fancy and free <laughs> and we gave it a go. But then we realised that we, well, it wasn't that we just realised we needed work. It wasn't going to be as easy to find work and make friends as we thought because of that age. We didn't have children. We'd actually been told in the UK that we wouldn't ever be able to have children naturally. So when we fell pregnant, that was really the best thing for me because it made me meet other Spanish mums that were in the same position Um, And then when the children were born, I was meeting many more Spanish people. And then when they started nursery and school, it just totally exploded. That's nice. I know that's not advice that everyone could take because that's not the answer. But it is about finding people in similar scenarios to yourself so that you've got something in common that you can talk about and that brings you together. 
and the Spanish are fantastic with that kind of stuff. And um, yes, yeah, some of my best friendships here are with some Spanish families from them very, very early days. And my children have very fantastic relationships with those children that they met in those early days too. And then of course the language, you know, I think we'd all say that our children's first language is probably Spanish. Um, speaking for sure. Mm. You know, it's, um, it's fantastic. It really is. Yeah, and I can fully see that. It, it, yes, that was a specific time in your life, but you're so right about common interests or, or being in the same place geographically, emotionally, whatever that means to you. It, it's finding those connections. It what is. about technology? Because obviously I know that's evolved over the 20 years that you guys have kind of started your journey to where you are now, but Facebook mm. offers you know, the amazing options of getting into groups and local communities. Do any of you use that now or was it something you used five years ago to try and build up a network? Do you use the technological side of things? I do, definitely. When we first moved here, so many people back in the UK, friends, um, my brothers, they wanted updates. Adam's parents, they wanted updates of what we were doing, how's this new life looking. And it was quite tedious to be creating emails, adding photos all the time to them, tweaking each one to suit who you're talking to. So then it was about that time that I joined Facebook and I thought that I will put my whole sort of like a little blog of moving here and everyone can see it all in one place. And yeah, I really, really liked that. It worked very, very well for me. And it's a very nice way to still keep in touch with a lot of those people. And I'm seeing friends that didn't have children either I'm seeing their children grow up Mm. um, and they're seeing mine grow up yeah I think the world gets smaller the world gets smaller with technology Claire you were going to say something sorry I interrupted I was just going to say I think it's changed a lot when I first came here we didn't really have all of these methods of keeping in touch it really was like trying to make a phone call every now and then or an email or whatever um, but now with all of the Facebook and, and all of the groups that you can have on Facebook, I've noticed that more recently there's loads of groups that have been set up on Facebook. So local groups that are offering, um, there's like gardening groups, but there's language exchanges mm. going on, you know, where people can get together and meet up a, on a Saturday. Mm. Um, and it goes out on a group that's open to Spanish and English. So you'll get a group of Spanish, a group of English that turn up each week and then they practice language skills with each other. I think there's like walking groups. Um, yeah, there was, um, when we first moved here, I recognised that there was a group on Facebook that was um, by Swap Cell down on, in the Costa del Sol. And I thought, well, I want to get involved with that, but there's nothing locally doing that. So I thought, well, I'm going to start it. And there's like nearly 10,000 members now to this group. And um, local people, English, Spanish, German, Danish, French, you know, people are just on there getting rid of stuff that they don't want, sharing out news or things that are happening. It's a, it's a really nice place. And the Spanish are very involved with that as well. Yeah, just community groups. I think that's the way forward. Dawn, I wanted yeah. to ask you, just thinking about, I mean, there's so many different nationalities in the in the part of Spain that you guys are and all over Spain. And we know that from the podcast. I interview people from all over the place and everyone loves Spain. Um, have you found that you had to learn Spanish customs because there is a kind of Spanish traditional way of life, but then you have this mixing pot of all of these different nationalities. Were there things that stood out to you as needing to learn the customs, the traditions and the way of life? Were there any surprises? Um... I suppose some of the customs, you know, it's just nice to take part in some of them. So, you know, sort of Christmas over here um, was a big shock, really, because we'd done the the typical thing the first Christmas where we'd Christmas Eve, you know, oh, let's go out, (laughs) we'll have a few drinks. And we got down to town at, say, about half past eight, and we were like, oh, where is everyone? Um, hmm, this is strange. Um, So we had a walk around anyway, finally found a, I think it was a Chinese restaurant actually what was open. So ended up going for a Chinese and then, um, you know, you get talking to people and then I went up to my neighbours and said, you know, what's going on sort of? And so we learned then that, of course, um, Christmas Eve is when all the Spanish family get together and they have their big Christmas celebration. Mm. So we then, from there on, we've always gone up to our neighbours 
um, normally for Christmas Eve. And then we do our traditional English Christmas um, at the house and either have goose turkey or whatever. But these days we've been barbecuing. So, you know, because normally the weather's so lovely, um, you can do that. So, yeah, there is, um, there's a lot of customs, traditions, um, like Easter week over here, what's known as Samana Santa. Um, I'll be very honest, I'm um, not that religious, but I always go to at least two or three. And there's such a moving experience, um, you know, just something very, very different than what we've got back in the UK. Um, we have many processions over the week down here in Almanyaka. You can go to Maligur, so, well, any place really. Um, but yeah, some very moving ones. Um, also going back to Christmas, of course, they wouldn't have originally given their presents where we do Christmas morning or Christmas day. Um, it would have been for Epiphany. So that's very different as well, mm -hmm. even though a lot of, you know, now you see more Christmas trees over here, you see the lights and it, it's all come over the years that it's got, you know, more sort of English American over the years. But yeah, there's a really good, I think, especially in Almanyaka, the, there's so many um, people. I mean, here where I live, my immediate neighbours are Spanish, but just over the next hill, we've got people from... France, um, Denmark, um, where else, um, Norway, you know, so there's a, a quite a, a, a mix really, but it all works out, you know, you have a, a party and it's just amazing to get everyone together. Even if some people don't speak Spanish, you know, everyone mucks in and, you know, sometimes it is a bit difficult when you're translating for people because you're there for, oh, right, hang on, oh, let me just tell you what they said. But Yeah, you know, it takes five it, times as long to have a conversation yeah. when you've got to translate it. <laughs> yeah. But it, it's just it's just so nice to get everyone together. Mm. Um, and, yeah, the traditions are, there's some really good ones over here. Um, should we go into sort of red, red wearing red pants as well? That's um, something <laughs> also what you need to, when somebody needs to buy you them. Um, so you can't buy them yourself. You A friend has to buy them and then you actually have to wear them on Christmas Eve. Okay, wait, um, is this, really is this pants as in American pants trousers or is this pants as in <laughs> British pants? You're talking about my underwear. <laughs> okay so, so who buys who the underwear well it can be a friend yes yeah, so you can't buy them yourself it's always got to be a friend who's got to buy them and then it brings you it, they do say luck or it brings you your loved one um to you so so yeah that's a nice tradition of course we have um also on um, New Year's Eve, when we get to 12 o'clock at night, we have the 12 grapes. So at each chime of the bell, you have to eat a grape, which is really good if you've got nice people who you've gone to and they get seedless grapes because it's so much easier. And then again, that brings you 12. If you manage to get all 12, it's 12 you know, good months for the following year. So there's, there's so many, I mean, we could be here for hours. Um, no, it's yeah. so nice though, that kind of learning about it all and, and swapping those traditions, like you say, and, and really, um, yeah, just learning the culture. What about, Claire, what about the day to day? So what about, is it true that it's a longer uh, break in the middle of the day? I'm thinking about, you know, nap time. I realise it's not called nap time. That's just how I think of it. But how do you feel about that? How was that adjustment? I've really got used to this over the years. I've even taken part in little nap every now and then. That that was kind of pre-kid. <laughs> yeah. I would, I would have a little nap at, at, in the lunch break. So normally the working day here for most people, not for everybody, but generally it will be like you start at 10 a.m. work. Lunchtime is sacred 2 o'clock. 2 o'clock, everybody's sitting down to eat. Um, and it's normally... a it's not like a sandwich and a yogurt over here. Generally, if you're with a Spanish family, it will be a full on meal at two o'clock. Um, and then, so you'll have between two and four normally as your kind of lunch break and then back to work at four or five um, and then finish at seven or eight in the evening. So it can be quite a long day in the end work-wise, but you do adjust 
adjust to it. You do get used to it. Um, the nice thing is now that um, a lot of the supermarkets will stay open during that period. When I first came here, everything was just shut down two o'clock till four o'clock. So you, you'd be, you know, even cafes and things like that, it would just be, which is really strange for us. Mm. You know, we're just not used to that. Everything's open sort of nine till five in the UK. That's just, that's just wasn't the case. Um, you do have to a little bit, depending on where you live. I live, I'm a bit different from the girls because I live in an urbanisation. So it's, it's a small, it's a gated community with about, I think we've got about 15 houses in total. And um, so the rule is that between two and four, you know, no children out playing, making a noise. Right. And things like needs to be quiet. And they do you think things have changed a little bit. Since we've moved here, I've definitely watched a change. Like when we first started calling agents and it might be nearing two o'clock or we'd be a little bit naughty and go a little bit after two, we used to get told off at times, didn't we? They'd say, do you know what time it is? And they'd put the phone down. Oh, wow. so now, agents might request for a call around that time because that's when they're not doing their viewings and, you know, mm. showdowns. And... Um, I don't remember the last time in the last few years, even when an agent made comment that we were talking to them during siesta time. Interesting. And the few side is a bit different. That's they've relaxed a little bit more, but I think residentially. Yes. Uh, if you're in a, if you're in an urbanization where you're where there are an awful lot, a lot of the living residential areas are communal. There are lots of communal living. And so in those communities, they still enforce, if you like, that kind of, you know, just be respectful and, and yeah. be quiet during that time. I think, I mean, I love it. I love that siesta break in the middle of the day. I think it's great. That, so there are some companies that I've spoken to for this series where actually they work on UK hours, for example, because a lot of their clients are in the UK. So I think it is it is shifting and it is just about sort of understanding, yeah, which applies where, like you say, <laughs> and, and when it's important to take that break and, and when it isn't. Now, this is a boring question, so I just want to prepare you ahead of time. Because even in the sun, even with all the idyllic lifestyle and even with just all the beauty around you there is still the day-to-day boring daily grind life admin stuff so i wanted to ask thinking of probably things like bills perhaps uh bin collections internet speeds you know the usual day-to-day have you noticed any massive differences in spain Uh, Mm -hmm. i don't mind who answers that if anyone has a kind of thing that they can think of when it comes to the day-to-day life admin Okay. When we were first moved here, sorry, Dawn, do you want to go? Don't mind. That was me, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All three of you spoke. Okay, see you. You go first and then I'll come to each of you. When we first arrived here, generally, internet was quite bad. Um, but last year, I had fibre connected and I know that I'm now faster than many colleagues in the UK and there's some envy going on with my internet speed. <laughs> so that's a big change. Um and services, yeah, customer service Customer service itself isn't like a hugely recognised thing here in Spain, not like it is in the UK, but things are getting better. We had a bit of a water leak yesterday and I rang the local water board, they came out and it's been fixed. As simple as that. Um, if it was your electricity, it might take a little bit longer. If it's your mobile phone, that might not be quite as easy. But I think slowly we're catching up with some of the ways of the UK. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Great. Got, what, 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 one of the things that um, I know it sounds really basic and it's something that you don't really, you're not going to think about when you're thinking about your dream home in Spain. But one of the things that my mum is always just so surprised with here is that bin collection is every single day of the week. Yeah. <gasps> Every single day. Oh, yes, see, I love that. That's and, amazing. And, and yeah, and you don't have to, this might be a bit bad, but you don't have to have one bin for paper and one bin for this and one bin for that. You just, it's your responsibility. If you want to go recycle stuff, they've got loads of recycling spots around the whole town that you can go to. But you, you don't have to stress about your rubbish. You know, you manage it how you like. And every single day they collect the rubbish, which is amazing. Yeah. Um, and the bin men hang off the back of the lorries still like they used to years ago. 
I do. <laughs> See, I knew there'd be goss. I knew there'd be goss on bin collection. This is what I wanted to ask about. This is what this is why people tune in. Dawn, what were you gonna say? My mine is totally different, right? So if you live out in the countryside, yes, the rubbish is collected every day, but we have to take our rubbish to the actual bins. Mm. So we, we have different stuff up here, so we can go at any time and just drop. So if you're driving down into town, you just take your rubbish with you and you just pop it in the bin again if you want to recycle. You know, they do not come to where I live. Mm-hmm. Um, also, um, we don't get post. So, I mean, I actually pay for a PO box actually in the post office. I could have a free one, but where it would be wouldn't really be in an area where I'd drive past ever, so it's right. just easier to use the post office. Um, delivery men won't normally come up here, so again, I use a very nice guy down in the town who's got a paint shop, who I've made friends with over the year, and he takes my posts for me, so that's <laughs> really good now. We're not on Mains Water. We're not on... Um, never been telephone lines up here um so yeah so it's a little bit different but saying that everything works perfectly you know the water system you need you normally buy into um the water but we actually had a borehole actually done uh, quite a few years ago now so you know we're not reliant on anyone um internet works quite good you know we there's no lines so it is all over you know through the air so to speak Mm. um but yeah it it all works well and it's moved on so quickly over say the last what four years four five Mm. years you know when i first came over here 20 years ago very very different yeah Incredible. Where do you learn things like that then? If, if someone was thinking, actually, do you know what? I do fancy being more rural. I do fancy being in the countryside. Where did you get your advice? Is this something that you learned as you go and you were kind of like, oh, do you know what? I'm, I'm not going to get post here. Or did you know that before you arrived and you could make those plans? No, um, I'll be honest with you. I didn't know before we came. Um, I did know about the water, I must admit, because there was trees, um, it was a, a case of, right, one of the main things is where does the water come from? We need to make sure we've got water rights. So that was all sorted out. Um, the electric, again, you need to make sure you're connected, you know, to a, an electric supply. We knew that was all okay. And then really it's just, you know, asking your neighbours. Um, I've got wonderful neighbours um, just, you know, at the, at the back of us here. And they are so, you know, extremely happy helpful so so yeah um you can find a lot out though i mean there's so much out there now you know this is 20 years ago yeah. where now there's so many forums you can go on the internet you can post questions you know um and people will answer you and help you out so it is so much easier these days if you're buying through an agent through an estate agent as well um generally i think you should if you're going to make a purchase rurally uh, that those should be your biggest questions to the age of the advertising agent because they should have a certain amount of information or they can get that for you from the from the vendor mm. so, although some of it some of them aren't as forthcoming as they could be with the <laughs> information but generally they know the 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 main you know, issues or problems that you should know about if there are any. Yeah, totally. That's good advice. I think people sometimes feel a bit shy asking questions of agents, but actually you're so right and they should be able to point you in the right direction. I wanted to ask, Claire, if you felt like Spain, it's quite a broad question, but do you feel like Spain is cheaper than the UK in your opinion? Oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) um, There are some things that I say, my mum tells me about in UK, you know, this sounds really sad, but she's been to the supermarket. She's got this amazing, I got three for the price of one or something. And you're like, wow, that never happens here generally in this town. It might do if you go to bigger places. But I have to say, anything like hairdressers, (laughs) uh, hairdressers are super cheap. In comparison, because I know my friends pay a fortune in the UK for for hair. Um, beauty treatments are super cheap in comparison. Uh, I find the dentists a lot, lot cheaper as well. Ch- 
childcare as well. Childcare is crazy. You can put your kid into um, a summer school during the summertime. Summertime's long here. The kids get nearly three months of holiday for summer. And so they run sort of um, not camps where the kids will stay overnight stays, but they run daytime summer schools. And you can check your kid in from 10 in the morning or nine in the morning till two o'clock. And um, I think it last time I put Oliver into one of these kinds of camps for a whole month, it cost me like 110 euros for a whole month. Wow. <laughs> vets as well. I think the vets in comparison to UK is pr- are probably a lot, lot cheaper. And they re- they offer an amazing service as well. They wow, really- that's so interesting. There's lots of things that you just wouldn't have thought of. See, and what about eating out um, food and drink? Is that cheaper day to day? I'm kind of, I always think of holidays and I would probably say yes, but I'm in holiday mode and I probably wouldn't care. I wouldn't, I'm not really paying attention. Do you know what I mean? Yes, yeah, so much cheaper. Food and drink here, eating out is so much cheaper. I mean, mm. to get some really nice fish on the beach, you might only need to pay 10 euros um, yesterday, I met my parents for lunch, and we have what they have, we had what's called a menu del dia, which is a menu of the day. And the place we went, it's seven euros, and it's a three course meal with bread and including a drink. Um, and I had a lentil bean stew to start. For main, I had a lovely giant plate of paella with all the bits that it needed in, and some lemon on the side. And I had a crema catalan for dessert. I had a drink and I had some bread for seven euros. Amazing. Also, the amount of times food has come up in this podcast, just this whole series. I just, I mean, the food is incredible. And it's just so good to know that it, that it becomes... It's so fresh. The food is so fresh here. You know, the, the fruit, the vegetables, the fish, it's just, it's so different. And some of the basic fruit and veg, you know, like tomatoes... They're just, it's a, its almost a different fruit or a different vegetable that we're eating here to what you guys are having. Interestingly, someone who came over from England a couple of years ago, um, she said it was the first time in, she didn't know, remember how many years that a, an onion had made her cry mm. because the onions in England just don't do that anymore. And I said, really? <laughs> and, but, you know, they're big Spanish onions here, very, very strong. Yeah, that's yeah. so interesting. The produce. And I bet you just, you do almost don't know what you're missing. You guys, no. presumably though, can never come back here. I was going to ask, how often do you make it back to visit people? But you're just going to take a bite of the fruit and it's not going to be as good and it's going <laughs> to rain. Like, <laughs> what does that look like? Dawn, how often do you make it back over? Um, normally, I'd most probably go back at least two, two times a year. Okay. Um, mainly... You know, sometimes, okay, my mum normally comes over, but also, you know, if it's a friend's special birthday or or something or, you know, so, yeah, so normally a couple of times and I'm very lucky because I normally just go back to more or less a village I'm from and I've still got friends who live there, so I just go and stay with them or yeah. go to one friend, then to another friend. So, but I do tend to go back and sometimes it's like, oh, have I, have I been away? <laughs> <laughs> I've not been anywhere for the last 20 years. So, so yes. Um, so, yeah, really, it's more so just to go and, and visit friends yeah. and family who haven't been over. Yeah. It's so nice, though, that you can keep those networks. And Claire, is that the same for you? How often do you make it back? In 20 years, I think I can count on both hands. Wow. <laughs> Interesting. OK. I, yeah, I really... It sounds terrible. I don't miss it at all. Because I have um, so my mum comes over. I said about four times a year. My my brother used to live here. He's moved back to the UK now. Um, my dad lives here over in the Malaga province. So I I really don't feel so much of a need to be going back. And I always kind of this. I, I kind of feel a bit resentful about using my holiday time from going to the UK. <laughs> be going somewhere else so the fact that everyone's sort of coming here it you know yeah i'm not i'm not that keen on going back (laughs) fair enough see and what what are your thoughts on that um i was going back probably four or five times a year um mainly to do with work and um it 
when I was back in the UK, that helped me feed the other things that I missed about the UK. So there's not many things. Um, there's a few eateries that I miss. Um, just taste of home, you know. And um, I do miss some UK shops. I mean, you can do it all online, but I am a real consumer and I love to go into some of the shops and have a real look around. And you're just familiar with the whole thing. It's mm. uh, I do miss that a little bit. But mm. as time goes on, you do acclimatise a little bit. And again, like Claire and Dawn, the majority of friends and family, they prefer to come and visit me rather than me go and visit them. That's the norm. When we first bought this house here, um, I liked this house in particular because it's got an apartment below the house. And I said, oh, we could always have friends and family come out and stay. But actually, that's always a little bit of advice I've given to people later on, saying it's probably not the best thing that you want to do because you are always entertaining people and sometimes two, three weeks at a time. And when you're living your normal life, working children, that entertaining in your space all the time can be a little bit, you know. Totally. So that's, that's, that's one change that I've had. So when we moved here, that's something I really wanted to do and provide for, where now I don't really. But things have changed. So I've got my parents here. Adam's parents used to come out quite a lot and stay in our apartment quite a lot. They now have moved here oh, um, wow. and got their own place. So, yeah, it's mainly friends and my brother that would come out and stay but yeah, yeah, I don't. I don't feel the need to go back to the UK ever, really. And I can't ever see me moving back. I think if things didn't go right here for any reason, I'd look at other countries, Portugal, yeah. Greece. I wouldn't. Um, it wouldn't be the UK, I'm afraid. No, I can tell that just from this conversation with you all. It's like, yeah, you're, none of you are ever coming back. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm here, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, just every every time I chat to you guys, I'm like, mm-hmm, yeah, they've they've got it right. Um, I wanted to ask about work um, because we've touched on this. I know that some of you had jobs set up when you moved over there. How have you found the job hunt or partners or friends of yours? How has the job hunt been for people who maybe haven't necessarily got their professional life ducks in a row for when they move? Have you found people have found work once they've arrived after the move? Yeah, definitely. I've always said if people want to work, they will find jobs. You know, there are jobs here, but you've you've got to want to do it because there's a high proportion of people that come out not wanting to work in the same way that that rat race worked in the UK. Mm. So there's a lot of people that move out wanting to do a little bit of work and then spend the money from that work. Um, My husband, he was a roofer in the UK. He really wanted to do something similar here but roofing is very, very different. And he knew he had to really try and make some friends within the English building community to understand the differences, the different materials, and maybe to get a bit of a job. And that's what happened. And then a few years down the line, you know, when he felt really confident that he knew everything there was to know about Spanish building, he set up on his own. Um, And lots of my friends, they do loads of, of, loads of varieties of work um but they mainly want to work it mm. is there if you want it mm. interesting and you the same claire dawn yeah it depends I, on what way you go as well doesn't it mm. but I, I think it's the same everywhere i think if you're england here if, if you've got the outlook um you know it, and it is easier as well these days you know you, there is You've got LinkedIn and and so on. I think it's a bit different here because some people have come out for a different lifestyle. They've come out to, you know, be an expat as in what that image portrays. They've come out to live a life of sitting on the beach with friends, having a drink, not working longer hours. Not everyone, but that's a lot of it. Or, you know, people might want to just work mornings so they've got the Mm. afternoon on the beach and the evenings, you know, sitting in the chilling people. Um, yeah. there, there is a different mindset here. That's a bit harder to find if you're trying to, if you're going to try to um, look for a job some in, within a company or a, a local business rather than if you're going to set up, try and do something by yourself. If you're going to try and do something by yourself, then you've got that freedom. Mm. If you're going to work for a company or a business locally, um, you need you need to be willing to work a job like 
you know, work the hours and, and you can't you can't kind of go in and say, well, I'm just want to work a couple of hours in the morning. That's not going to happen. No, if you're totally. Go on your own and and do something by yourself, then you know, you, you've got that that option. Yeah, to totally. Yeah. That makes sense. That makes sense. Well, my last question, because we have come to the end, is. It's a, it's a broad one, but your favourite things, I mean, I can I can always tell by talking to you guys, you just light up whenever you talk about your lifestyles and whenever you talk about oh. Spain. But do you have a favourite thing to do in Spain or a reason that for you makes the move 100% the right thing just to leave people on if they're, if they're teetering on the brink of making the move and doing what you guys have done? Claire, do you want to go first? There's so much. Um... You know, one of my favourite things to do here is, and we did it this morning, is uh, you can get up in the morning, get the kids off to school, and you've got time before you start work because you're not starting that early here. Um, and I met up with Dawn and off we went for a walk along the Paseo on the seafront quite early, so there's not loads of people around. The sun's just coming out. You can hear the sea as you're going for your walk along. And then we stopped on the way back and sat at the cafe and had our toast with tomato and coffee, lovely coffee from the machine. It's like a fiver for both of our breakfast Mm. and off to work we go. And what a lovely way to start your day. And you can do that nearly all year round, really, because the climate is just beautiful where we are. You don't get you. We do get some, obviously, get a winter and some rain, but it's it, on the whole, we have we're really lucky. And um, it's an amazing place if you've got children or grandchildren. It, it's just a beautiful place for them to be. It's really, really safe in comparison to other places. It's such a relaxed feeling. It's, it's just a beautiful place for children. And uh, fantastic. I, I definitely wouldn't trade it. I definitely wouldn't trade it. Dawn, do you want to go next? Do you agree with that? Yeah, totally agree. So, I mean, how long have we got? I've got to try and pick just <laughs> one. Oh, this is a difficult one. For me personally, I suppose, because, you know, I live in the countryside, I love walking. So for me, last night, I finished work. I got the dog. We went up um, the hillsides. I mean, most probably in the UK, you'd most probably call them semi-mountains. You know, it is quite hilly round here. And you can hear the birds. I've got one side, I'm looking over to the Sierra Nevada. You can still see the snow. On the other side, you're looking down onto the Mediterranean. And I still just go, wow, how lucky am I to be here? You know, every morning I wake up to this amazing view. The the light, if you're into photography, is just amazing over here. And, you know, I do still, as I think I even said to Claire this morning, the day when I wake up in the morning and I open my eyes and I see my view and I, and I get a bit like, oh, is when I need to move. But I can't see that ever happening because I, I just love it. I love the countryside. I love the sea. You know, everything's here. If you want to go sailing, We've got the Marina del Esta just down the road, so I do a bit of sailing. If you want to go skiing, you've got the Sierra Nevada in the winter. I love the season. So anyway, my one has turned into <laughs> quite a few, so <laughs> let's pass over. No, that's to- perfect. That's perfect. And Cian, what about you? I'm a bit the same. I don't know what to choose, so I'm going very broad. It is basically quality of life. My lifestyle is fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sorry to say it myself, but I love my life. Um, a bit like what Dawn said, the nature around here, the scenery, um, being so close to the beach. I have to hear my mum say every day, oh, Sian, do you know that we're living on the Mediterranean Sea? It's like I live in a novel. You know? <laughs> oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> that's so nice. She said, I actually read about people living on the Mediterranean Sea in novels when I was a child. Um but it is, it's so magical. Everything is magical. And you know what? Probably something that ought to be mentioned is that big blue sky. That makes me feel awesome every single day. And if you spot a little bit of white cloud, it's like, oh my God, we've got some cloud. Um, you know, and if we have a rainy day, we always know it's going to be super sunny again tomorrow. It's, you know, yeah. I think that 
knowing that the weather supports a fantastic lifestyle outside. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I think that's a fantastic place to leave it on. As if people weren't convinced enough going into this episode, I think <laughs> that you, you guys have given it such a glowing review. Thank you. Thank you for spending your time with me this morning. It's been so nice to see all your smiling faces. Thank you, Beth. It's been really enjoyable. Yeah, thank you so much, Beth. Thank <laughs> you.